glad to be back with you guys this morning. Full disclosure, I don't have a tattoo, so wipe that idea from your mind. And we're not necessarily uh, encouraging everyone to get tattoos. If you have a tattoo, that's awesome. If you don't and you're under 18, it's up to your parents. We'll just have to put that out there. Um, Lily Tomlin said, how many of you remember who Lily Tomlin was? Four, six people? That's awesome. Edith Ann sitting in the rocking chair, the best stuff right there. Um, Lily Tomlin said, why is it that when we claim we're talking to God, it's called prayer, but when we claim God is talking to us, it's called schizophrenia? Ain't that the truth? I mean, it is kind of weird when people say, God told me this, or God told them that, and the, and the truth is that throughout history, people have used that concept in damaging ways in ways to enhance their own power or get people to do things for them. Um, but at the same time that is all true, what is it then that we do with this? What do we do about the teachings in here and the stories and the truths? What do we do with the fact that this book relentlessly insinuates that God is a communicator. God is a communicating kind of God, that God speaks. Even in the creation story, in the very first chapters of the Bible, the writers of Genesis use this imagery, this metaphor, that God spoke the universe into being, that somehow... God used his voice to set things in motion. And then we continue to read that God speaks to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and Deborah and Ruth. And then we have these fiery Old Testament prophets who claim that God speaks to them and then they somehow are God's voice to the people of God. God is speaking through them. And then we get to the New Testament. You know, and we, we find God speaking to Joseph and to Mary. And then there's Jesus, God in human flesh, the Son of God. And he's called the Word. In the opening chapter of the Gospel of John, John calls him the Word of God. And he's called that for a reason, because Jesus' life and his teachings are actually, according to Jesus, God's speech to us. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. And then he said, I don't speak my own words, but I speak the words of him who sent me. And then he often said, especially after he taught something difficult, he said, let those who have ears to hear, hear. And then God in his wisdom, he knew we would have a hard time listening and he knew we would have a hard time remembering what we've heard. So he empowered some folks and inhabited some folks to write some things down. And then we call this, the Bible, the word of God as well. And throughout the centuries, people just like us have come to this book on a quest to hear God's voice. What do we do with this? An old professor of mine writes that the word listen appears over 1,500 times in the Bible. And in both the Old and the New Testament, we read that listening to God is supposed to be the primary act, the number one job of God's people. And yet, you know what God's most frequently voiced complaint is in the Bible? You can guess. It's that people don't listen. The people don't listen. God's voice thunders through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 8. Just this little word describes us so well. God says, you have neither heard nor understood from of old your ears 
have not been open. You see, apparently God is a communicator. And apparently God wants us to listen to his voice. And apparently we have a hard time with this. So as we continue this series that Jeff started at the gathering, this series that we're calling Tattooed, we're going to talk a little bit this morning about what it might mean and look like to listen for God's voice. If you were at the gathering, uh, uh, let me just say this, if you weren't at the gathering, I really encourage you to watch it online. It's on our website. But if you were there, you heard Jeff say that we've all been tattooed, we've been marked, we've been stamped by God with these words, mine and eternal. And some of us here have come to know and understand and be so grateful that we've been marked by those words. Some of us here are just learning that we've been marked by those words. And others of us here have allowed ourselves to listen to other voices, other powers, and we've let ourselves be marked with different kinds of words, words like worthless and failure and sinner and forgotten, unlovable, coward. None of those words are true. And we all need to learn afresh to listen in our lives for the voice that calls us mine and loved and forgiven and welcomed. And part of how we do this, part of how we see and understand afresh what we've really been marked by, by God, is that we encounter and then learn to follow Jesus. He wants to tattoo us with his words, his labels for us. And this idea comes right out of our mission statement, which is helping next generations encounter and follow Jesus to bless a broken world. We've done a series, a teaching series, on almost every single phrase and part of this statement except for the word follow, which is our focus for these next few weeks. As followers of Jesus, we are to be marked, we are to be tattooed by love. Jesus is so clear about this in John, the 13th chapter. He's just starting to share with his disciples what's about to happen to him. And he says to them in verse 34 and 35 of John chapter 13, he says, a new command I give you, love one another. Right? The Jewish people had all these commands that they felt they had to follow. And Jesus is saying, listen, I'm going to sum this up for you in one new command. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, by this one mark, he's saying, everyone will know that you are my disciples, my students, my followers. Here's the one mark that is supposed to be on your life. If you love one another. If we're following Jesus, we will be marked by a radical kind of sacrificial love for others, period. And if we're marked by something else other than that kind of radical love, we're not following Jesus. We're following something else. Now, I want you to think about this idea for a minute, this idea of following Because to follow someone means there has to be a leader. And if there's a leader and we're following that leader, we have to be close enough to either see where that leader's going or or we need to be able to hear that leader's voice in some way so our leader can guide us in the path that that leader wants us to be on. But let's be honest for just a minute here as we talk about this. How do we follow Jesus. This is a phrase that we use in church all the time. We talk about being followers of Jesus. We rarely explain it, and we just expect you all to figure it out. But here's some insight, just a little bit, that might be helpful as we try to process what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus, in the 10th chapter of John, talks about 
in very clear language, but metaphorical, so maybe it's not that clear, but we're going to try to unpack it. What it means to follow him. John chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. So he's using a metaphor now of the, of the leader of a group of sheep. He's saying, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. His sheep are the people who are devoting themselves to him. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Then he goes on in verse 27 and says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. So as we look at those words of Jesus, I want you to notice that there's something very important that he's saying in our quest to know what it looks like to follow him. He's saying that there's a knowing of him, and then there's a listening to him, and, and those two things kind of equal following. And it, it seems to me like Jesus is saying that he, God the Son, is also a communicator. And that those who devote themselves to knowing him, that's, that's the quest of a lifetime, his sheep can hear him. Somehow we can hear him and follow him. He's saying that we can learn to recognize his voice and we believe that his voice can somehow mysteriously still be heard by his followers even today. So how in this noisy world can we strengthen our listening skills? How in this world where we've just been trained to hear with our physical ears can we learn to listen with the ears of our spirit, with the ears of our heart? You know that kind of internal hearing of a voice? How can we become those with ears to hear so that we can be marked by love? I've been thinking about these questions for the last 35 years of my life. And I want to just share a couple ways that I have been trying, failing, but trying to become the kind of person who has ears to hear. I, I try to practice in my life a couple kinds of listening. And the first kind that I try to practice is what I call intentional listening. Intentional listening is simply put, time that I intentionally set aside from other activities and other voices and noise to very specifically seek out God's speaking voice. And this can happen in all kinds of ways based on your personality and your learning style. So don't get hung up on how I do it, but just listen and ponder about how this might work in your life in some way, shape, or form. Because how it happens best for me is by setting aside some time. It doesn't have to be a lot of time, but it's almost always in the morning you know, before the rush of the day kind of sweeps me away. And it's not every morning, but it's more mornings than not. I set aside some time to be quiet and to open my Bible and to get out a pen and a journal and to maybe also have some other reading at that same time. And then what I try to do is, is to read a bit of scripture and to ponder what it says and to journal about it, and to ask God questions, and to tell God things that I'm thinking, and then to try to listen in the silence to hear God speak back to me. And sometimes that happens, and sometimes it doesn't, and that's okay. But, but when it does, I experience a, a new thought, or, or a prayer, someone I should pray for, or, or an idea about something I've been confused about or a prompting of something I need to do. And sometimes full paragraphs that I should put into teaching come into my head. And for that, I am oh so very grateful. Now, why do I read the Bible during this time? Right, that's another question that we should ask. And it's a good question, so I'm glad you asked it. And I will now answer it. See, engaging with the Bible, which is one of the, the ways that we, you know, practice our faith around here, engaging with the Bible is one of the most powerful ways that I familiarize myself with God's voice. 
Someone once said that the scriptures are like a tuning fork for our ears so that we can recognize the tone of God's voice. That's such beautiful imagery. Because God's voice, like any other voice, has certain qualities to it. It has certain characteristics. It has a tone. It has a timbre that we can learn to recognize when it shows up in our lives. And first learning to see it and to read it and to hear it in the Bible is a great way to become familiar not only with what it sounds like, but the types of things that God tends to speak about, like having your heart transformed or laying down your life for him or loving your neighbor or your enemy or making sure that you care for the widow and the orphan and the stranger in your midst. You see, Scripture helps us develop the ears of our spirit so that we can recognize God's voice. Let me pull back the curtain for just a minute on on what this looked like once in my life a few years back. Before I was on staff here at Orchard, I volunteered my time to teach. And I had three three little ones. And for seven years, I was a volunteer teacher here at church. And I loved it. And I was so grateful for the opportunity. But in my soul, I knew there was something more ahead for me. But I didn't quite know what it was. And I couldn't see the path. And it was a painful time in my spirit. It lasted for about three years. And when I was out and about in the community, you know, I was raising my kids. I was volunteering at church. And I felt that people discounted me when they learned about what I did because I didn't have a for-pay kind of job. And so during a season of my life in which I was training for the swimming part of a triathlon, this is a true story, I was the swimmer in a team for a triathlon. Jeff Mickey was the runner and Kurt Vanderwill was the biker. And I was so nervous about being a part of this team that I was getting up at 4.30 in the morning to get to the YMCA by 5 so I could swim 1,500 or 2,000 yards before my family got up. And so one morning I came back smelling of chlorine, tired, and the house was still dark. Everybody was asleep. And I got home and I just sat in the quiet again and I brought all my questions and confusion to God. And, and I sensed in my insides that God was speaking to me. This is a bit how the dialogue went. Me. God, what am I doing with my life? God, I I sensed his voice in my spirit. You work for me. Me. Well, what do I do for you? God, whatever I tell you. Me. Well, how does that work? You report to me each morning, and I'll give you your assignment. We'll work it out together, but the bottom line is you work for me. Me. So what do I tell people when they ask what I do with my life? God. Tell them you work for me. Now, that might all sound crazy to you. And I get it. I really, I do. But I'm just telling you my experience. You know, this whole time I'm writing in my journal, I'm listening, I'm sensing God. And part of how I recognize that this probably was the voice of God, you know, I'm always a little questiony, how I recognized it was his voice and not just my own crazy, you know, is that through the years I had immersed myself in the scriptures and I knew That at one time, I I remembered reading it, that Jesus had said in John chapter 4, the very start of his ministry, he had said, my food, he was was meaning my, my work in the world is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus basically said, I work for my father. That's what I do. And so I knew this kind of language was in the mouth of God the Son. And so what I was hearing in my own spirit sounded like God. The tuning fork of Scripture had prepared my ears to recognize the tone when it came. And listen, 
I just showed up that morning kind of wanting God to just find me a job. But this was the end result of this conversation. So note to self, you're not in charge when God speaks to you. Just be prepared for that. And here's something very important I want to say as well. I didn't just sit down one day and expect to hear God's voice. I showed up over and over and over and over. I showed up in my confusion, in my pain, in my doubt, in my weaknesses, in my questioning. I showed up in the dark in the morning. I had to set aside time to be available and to listen over and over and over because I knew that the prophet Jeremiah, again, you know, the voice of God speaking through the prophets, And I'm going to read verse 12 as well as verse 13 of Jeremiah 29. This is what it says. Then you will call on me and come to me and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And then God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. See, God speaks to us in the context of a growing relationship, He's not like a magic eight ball where you can just buy it off the shelf, shake it after you give it a question and it will give you an answer. God's not like call the courier where you can just send in a question and get a paragraph answer. He's not a tarot card reader and God ain't Google, okay? God says, seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. And that's what the set-aside time of intentional listening is all about. So this is a really important component of learning to listen as we practice following Jesus. But I've learned that I can't just set aside some times in the morning to listen for God's voice and then check it off. Because there's this whole other thing that happens when I leave that space and it's called my life. And God is not cordoned off from my life or from yours. He loves our ordinary everyday life, and he wants to communicate with us in it. So I practice another kind of listening. Sometimes I forget, but I try to practice what I call everyday listening. There's intentional listening, and then there's everyday listening. Because did you know that in your lifetime, most of us will spend 2,000 hours brushing our teeth, 16,000 hours driving, 44,000 hours eating. Isn't that awesome? 44,000 hours. And almost 60,000 hours doing chores. Wah, wah. This is all of us. We all do these things. And in the midst of them, whether we recognize it or not, God is speaking to us, even on the most boring and mundane days of our lives. God speaks. And I have found a powerful connection between times of intentional listening and times of everyday listening. They go together. And developing time for that intentional listening then spills over into my life, setting me up for hearing God while I mow the lawn or drive to High V, or stand in line at the post office or do the dishes. I heard a sweet friend say the other day that her children were keeping her from having a spiritual life. And I just looked at her, and typical of me, without thinking, I just blurted out, no, they're not. I said to her, caring for your children right now is as spiritual an act as you'll ever do. Don't be fooled. There is no other place, there's no other time, there's no other kind of moment you're going to have where you will experience God, except whatever moment it is that you're living right now. God is speaking to you while you care for those little children. And it's the same for all of us. Whatever your life context is, don't be fooled. Intentional times of listening are important, but only because they set us up to have ears that we'll hear while we're driving carpool or fixing the garbage disposal or sitting by the side of your grandma at the nursing home or changing your baby's diaper. Jesus says to all of us, let he or she who has ears to hear, hear in the midst of what we might consider mundane, boring, secular activities. In the midst of all of those, God speaks. 
He'll give you a nudge or a prompting to call someone, to pray for someone, to go back somewhere and fix something. You might get an uncanny urge to give money to a cause or a person that you know is in need because you just read something in the Bible that reminds you that the poor and the needy are close to God's heart. And my encouragement to you is that when you sense that prompting and you sense that it aligns with Scripture, go do it. Go be obedient to it. That's the most profound form of listening. So engaging the Bibles, tuning our ears to the sound of Jesus, his teachings, his words, his parables, his primary command to love, those things will come back into our mind in the middle of the day because that is what the Holy Spirit's job is. Jesus said before he left this earth in John 26, he said, listen, my Holy Spirit is going to come. The Holy Spirit is also God. And his primary job is to remind you, Jesus said, of everything I've said to you. So be on your toes. Be expectant, especially when things get quiet in the shower. God is with you in the shower. Don't be frightened, but it's true. He has things to say to you because you're finally quiet. Or on the bike trail or when you crawl in bed at night or in the car. This happened to me the other day in my car. I was just driving along. I finished a class at the Sportsplex, and I saw one of those people who sits on the median or sits by the side of the road with a sign And it said, just trying to get through the day, please help. And I normally drive by because I think to myself, what we've all heard, well, don't give them money or they'll buy alcohol. And then I think to myself, well, if I was homeless and somebody gave me money, I'd probably buy alcohol. (laughs) So I sensed God's voice saying, you go back and give him some money and you look him in the eye and you say some kind words because that's a child of mine. So I drove around, had to go back down the highway, turn around. I I got into like a gas station parking lot and I had to wait until the light was just right for the timing so I could get right next to him on a red light. So I, you know, shot in there as fast as I could, rolled down my window. I grabbed everything that was in my wallet, which happened to be $4, poor guy. And I rolled my window down and I handed it to him and I said, you know, peace, my friend, peace. And he just looked at me and said, you know, I'm just trying to get by day by day. His, his face was all tattooed and not with butterflies and rainbows. And his eyes were kind of lost and lonely. But he smiled at me. And I just said, you know, we're all just trying to get by. I hope this is helpful to you. And he smiled and that was it. God told me to go do that. If we follow Jesus, if we claim his name as ours... The truth of the matter is we are to be marked, we are to be tattooed by radical love. And to live out this mark, I don't know about you, but I need to learn to hear God's voice, Jesus' voice, the Holy Spirit's voice. They're all the same thing. I need to learn to hear it intentionally and in my everyday life. And you can do this. We can do this. We can do it together. It is a profoundly good way to live. Let's pray. God, you are a communicator. And you tell us to seek us. And you'll be found by us if we seek you with all our hearts. So God, would you take all the time and energy that we devote to housework or sports or music or whatever it is, would you help us harness some of that energy to set it aside to learn to become listeners to your voice? Because we need to hear you, God, so we can follow you. Otherwise, we will be led astray over and over and over and over. So please help us to become listeners. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.